next week we will hear from Alex Friedland of Milantis on OpenStack. If you don't know what OpenStack is or who Milantis is, you will have a chance to figure it out. Dr. Kushesh reminded me that immediately to today's colloquium, we can go to Darwin 28 and partake in our what seems to be the DNA of computer science students is pizza. Yes. Lots of pizza. So that's really that for today's quote. I hardly need to introduce mm -hmm. Jason Shackle. He's been one steady speaker throughout the years. And he comes up with new topics. Today he's going to talk about the mental self and uh, how we will benefit from being the board. <laughs> so let's talk about people. Thank you. Yes, my name is Jason Shankel. I am a software developer at Sintertainment, which is a uh, mobility company run by Will Wright, uh, developer of The Sims and SimCity in my previous incarnation. Uh, I worked at uh, Maxis doing uh, mainline game development on The Sims and Spore and SimCity and things like that. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working in, in mobility. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I'm calling the psychology of the augmented world um, and how we are going to be using uh, psychological techniques and how we have been using psychological techniques uh, to develop and to market uh, lifestyle applications um, for our mobility platforms and whatever comes beyond. So first of all, how many of you have one of these? or something like it, basically. And how many of you use this uh, device to uh, stay in touch with friends or remote uh, associates, uh, socially network online, to chat, uh, to coordinate your schedule, to look into your life, to monitor your exercise and your, and your habits? Right? These devices, uh, these mo mobility devices, have been a game changer, obviously, in the last couple of years in terms of um, populating the, our customer base, essentially, as technology workers, um, with, uh, with tech that people will use and engage with that can teach us a lot about their behavior, a lot more than we were able to learn from them um, simply at the desktop online. Uh, and we learned a lot from them that we hadn't learned, you know, using telephones and newspapers and TV in the 80s. And so I drew this up real quick from uh, Edison. It's it's last couple of years worth of uh, demographic penetration data for smart technology. And as you can see across the board, uh, especially young people and and uh, you know middle aged people, uh, very active. But all groups are growing, and actually it's the elderly who are growing most rapidly in terms of adoption. Both because. Uh, you know, this demographic gets older, and so they slide into there, and also because uh, broader market penetration and introduction uh, has, has made it more appealing uh, to older audiences. So we're seeing a massive growth in the technology of smartphones, you know, even to the point now, how many people have seen the ad where it's like uh, kind of an unhip older mom who thinks that your, your, your Facebook wall is actually photos that you put up on a wall, and her friend is like, this is not how any of this works, right? That appeal uh, comes from the fact that uh, the smartphones are becoming as ubiquitous as television and as radio uh, have been in the past. Okay. And um, what smartphones provide us with uh, that ordinary phones haven't and uh, um, the web to now has not is the opportunity to create what is a movement called the quantified self. And I've given a whole talk just on quantified self in the past. You can look that up. You could also, uh, uh, you know, Google it and track down some of the leads to it. And what quantified self is, it's a, it's a technology and social uh, initiative movement. It's, it, you know, populated by developers who are working at startups and at big companies and things like that to figure out how we can leverage social networking, biometrics, and advanced data visualization to create a feedback system for people so that they can monitor their own behavior, learn a little bit something about their, their patterns, observe the patterns of other people, and uh, take it upon themselves to make positive changes. So kind of the typical applications you'll see in quantified self is improving your diet, uh, increasing your exercise, uh, improving your sleep regimen, quitting smoking, 
uh, uh, limiting your drinking, dealing with any other substance abuse issues you might have or any other negative elements of your psychology that you want to address. Essentially cognitive behavioral therapy kinds of interventions, kind of at the pop psychology level. So I, for example, you know, exercise is one of my issues. I, I have a difficult time being motivated to do it. And so I joined a, a social network of people who brag about the number of push-ups they're doing, and we, we have these little achievement meters and things like that. And of course you can cheat. Of course you can say, I did 100 push-ups today, but there's no point, right? You, the, the, the mechanics of gaming and of, of social interaction that, that positively reinforce uh, my, you know, desired behavior is specifically what I'm seeking, you know, when I do that. Other people, you know, like I said, limit eating, that kinds of things. Um, and what makes this possible, you know, here's a, here's a version of that, that, that 60s, <laughs> right, or 70s rather, uh, uh, social networking device, and here's today. So the, the, the idea has been around for a long time, the image has been around for a long time, that we're going to be carrying these data pods and we're going to be able to scan with our little tricorders and figure ourselves out and that kind of thing. Now, naturally, uh, there are privacy issues with this. There are concerns about like, well, you know, do I want to tell anybody that I smoke? I'm trying to cut down to a, a half a pack a day when I've told my insurance company I don't smoke and that kind of thing. All that's going to get resolved, and I'm not really here to address uh, like what if this, what if that. This is more about this is a movement that's emerging. We're going to find a place of comfort. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the internet became a commercially viable thing and email started to happen and spam started to occur and there was this tremendous, you know, generalized fear of like, oh my God, people are going to be getting, receiving all kinds of automated emails and they can be scams and this and that. And now it's kind of a joke, Nigerian Prince stuff. We don't think of as a major social threat because we have integrated into our society the idea that email is not a completely safe way to just you do whatever you want. You, you should certainly follow up if you receive something from someone you don't know and all that kind of stuff. Um, and just like any other kind of negative social consequence from new technology, like we saw with the telephone, telephones essentially created uh, different kinds of, of, of negative sales pitches when you're getting sold, you know, bad, bad property in Florida. Uh, the television and, and marketing and those things all have had these negative consequences. And quantified self will too. You know, and so there's, there's no doubt about that. But it's the beginning of a uh, way of receiving data about customers in a way that we never really could before. Self-reported constant interaction with a digital medium where uh, um, you're not filling in a form, you're not volunteering to come in. It's very valuable uh, from a marketing perspective. Okay, so yeah, here we go. Here's, here's some of the motivations of quantified self. Biometric data, your heart rate your economic behavior, your online behavior, and your personal habits. And these are all things that people are voluntarily posting to Facebook, you know, essentially. And um, the, the, the goal, of course, is, as I said, is to, to create a, a customizable life, like you're almost like a video game character, where you can you decide, I want to be more fit, or I want to have more friends, or, or I want to be better read. And I can, I can seek out social support. Um, and, and, and positive feedback for, uh, for improving myself along these lines. That's the reward, that's the carrot of this uh, thing. And anytime we're asking people to give up some privacy or expose some data, there always has to be that kind of reward. The second element of the augmented life uh, that is coming into existence now is uh, augmented reality. Now, AR is uh, it's a form of virtual reality, it's a form of VR, where instead of projecting a completely constructed world into your senses, like we do with Oculus Rift or, or on a TV screen or something like that, uh, we create a model of the real world, excuse me, real physical world uh, right around you, and we tag it either with informational overlays or game characters or uh, uh, additional, you know, uh, like x-ray insight information or, or models of like what you're working on if you're working on an on a engine. And uh, typically this, you know, right now, we have these technology demos that go in through like a Google Glass device or a, uh, or a pad or a phone that you hold up because it has orientation and position and knows what it's looking at. And this technology right now is, is very much in its infancy, as is quantified itself. You know, we're kind of stumbling around in the days of the early net when people had 56K modems and had to dial out and, 
you know, Mozilla was a brand new idea and that kind of thing. We're, we're just seeing tech demos that are starting to be impressive um, around like, hey, I'm shopping for a house. Let me wander through this neighborhood that I'm interested in and hold things up and see uh, on a house for sale and see what's tagged. Or, hey, I'm repairing a car engine and I need to be able to see what the wiring diagram is going to look like. Or, you know what, I think I'm going to perform open heart surgery. I'm <laughs> downloaded an app and I've got a knife. And <laughs> you know. Uh, or, hey, there's, there, there's orcs here. And uh, so augmented reality is uh, um, it's kind of in the place where 3D technology was in the mid-90s where it has a broad base of applications, uh, technical, medical, personal lifestyle, you know, uh, things like that, as well as entertainment. But most crucially, especially for some, for me, is entertainment. Uh, because all the other, you know, the other kinds of categories of things, except with the exception maybe of, of, pers uh, of personal lifestyle stuff, ends up being a niche market. There are only so many auto mechanics, there are only so many cardiac surgeons in the world, you know, and, and they obviously need the most advanced technology, and they're willing to pay tremendously for it, and it doesn't have to be consumer quality or anything else like that. People looking to shop or whatever with a device, yes, uh, you know, if, if, if you get over the price point and this kind of stuff, obviously, you know, we have mobility in everybody's hands, that's very useful. And gaming and entertainment uh, is another kind of luxury interaction with technology that drives innovation. You know, and in a previous version of this talk, I, I discussed how, like, 3D visualization technology went from something that was based in, you know, scientific visualization and maybe animation for film and all kinds of like heavy duty applications where we're talking about $20,000 workstations to now where you know everybody has a 3D card in their computer that's far more advanced than anything existed in the 90s driven largely by the desire to game on, you know on a computer or on a, on a console or whatever so Nvidia and, and, and companies like that have had a reason to commodify what used to be in a, a highly advanced technology and so entertainment tends to drive that kind of thing it tends to drive performance innovation. So that's what we're going to be seeing in augmented reality is once I can project orcs all over the place, well then I can really, you know, repaint your house for you and do all these other kinds of things that might have a, a higher threshold of interest. You know, like people might not want to clear that, but they, they do want to fight some orcs, right? Okay. So these two uh, ideas, uh, uh, the quantified self and augmented reality, the idea of measuring your own behavior and your biometrics and things like that, feeding back upon yourself and then projecting the results of that into the world so that you have a window on the world reflective of who you are that lets you see things that are going to reward that reflection, that, that whole cycle, okay, um, is missing something. Um, and what is missing, most essentially, is the notion of the self. Who are you that we're quantifying? When we go in and we quantify, we say your heart rate is this and your mood is that and your, you know, you, the last time you had pizza was here and, and, and now I'm showing you a pizza monster coming at you so you can fight it because, hey, you know, reward. Uh, I have to have some idea of who you conceptualize yourself to be, okay? And that's always the tough bit with any kind of, of consumer product is understanding not just how the customer sees themselves, but how um, you can help them see themselves in a way that's beneficial to your product and makes them happy. So how many people have heard of Sigmund Freud? <laughs> Do you wonder why you've heard of Sigmund Freud? I mean, here's a guy, right, whose specific theories about human psychology and human development have at this point largely been rejected by, by clinical psychology. We don't really hear very much anymore about penis envy or the electric complex or the Oedipus complex or repressed uh, sexual desire being the root of all of our neuroses and if only we can summon up some sexual fantasy we had when we were 27 months old we can dismiss all these nightmares that we have that's really kind of an old-school thing and we've kind of also dismissed the idea that there is a clinical talk therapy based cure for anxiety or for uh, you know uh, low self-esteem or for any of the or for any of these these things that Freud was trying to treat largely as a result of years of unsuccessful clinical uh, um, experimentation with with 
you know, Freudian theory. It's like, it's not helping anybody, right? There's, there, there doesn't appear to be these deeply repressed big revelations that if I could just remember the screwed up birthday party I had when I was three, that it would it'll clear things up. And yet, we all still think of Freud as like the father of psychoanalysis and he's, and he's you know, it's still considered pretty foundational. And it, it's kind of a fair assessment to say that Freud is kind of to psychoanalysis what Aristotle is to science. Aristotle's specific scientific theories are all wrong. The, the Earth is not the center of the solar system. Objects do not naturally slow down when they're moving. There aren't four elements, you know, or six or whatever he came up with, right? But Aristotle's view of science is the one that we still have today, which is experimentation, verification, naturalistic explanations for things and all that. So even though we don't actually incorporate a lot of Aristotle into our thinking, our worldview is completely Aristotelian, right? And it led to Newton and to Einstein and to, and to uh, um, you know, Stephen Hawking. Similarly, Freud's um, prescriptions for how we should live, in the absence of psychometric drugs that work, you know, or, 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 or uh, uh, ooh, excuse me, um, psych psychiatric drugs that work, I'm sorry. And in the absence of, of, a, of a great deal of clinical history, um, you know, he was sort of stumbling around in the dark, but he introduced a model of thought that all of you are carrying around today and um, explain a little bit about where that comes from. How many of you have the idea in your head that your life is yours, that you are here to pursue your happiness, that you get to pick your career, you get to pick if and when you're going to marry, have children, you know, raise a family or not, stay in this country, move somewhere else, right? I know I was raised with this idea. And I got a lot of this idea also reinforced through advertising, right? Is that if I'm discontent, see if this sounds familiar, if I'm unhappy, if I don't like my life, it's on me to go find a solution. And there's a lot of them on offer. I can download an app that'll help me exercise more. I can take a vacation. I can buy, a, I can rent a different apartment. I can buy a new car. I can study philosophy. I can become spiritual. I can change religions. I can do what I want to do, but it's on me and the choices are out there. This worldview, which even if you don't necessarily completely <coughs> endorse it for yourself, clearly you get it, you've heard it, you've seen it before, you conceptualize it, is relatively new in the human experience. In the last century or so, it has become a commonplace idea. Our founders had this idea with, you know, the right to pursue happiness. It's a self-evident right that we shall pursue happiness. That was an idea of the Enlightenment. That was an idea of very educated, very erudite people, not like regular guys down on the farm, held, held on to that. Those ideas percolated down to the rest of our culture um, after, you know, uh, Franklin and Jefferson and those guys, you know, wrote about them. So the reason we kind of still have this orientation toward Freud is because, not because of Freud or anything he really did, actually, it's because of his two most famous relatives. And these are people uh, that I highly recommend you look into uh, the, their, their contribution to our culture. There's a documentary that was put out, uh, I, think, I thought it was in the 80s, but according to the research I did, it was more like 10 years ago, but it, it only really covers up until the 80s, uh, the version I saw by Adam Curtis called The Century of the Self. This idea that we all have of the self-directed life and the pursuit of happiness was engineered by Freud's relatives for specific reasons in the 20th century. The first relative is his nephew. This is a guy named Eddie Bernays, B-E-R-N-A-Y-S. He's the most influential person in your life that you've never heard of. Eddie Bernays coined the term propaganda, which later became a negative term in World War I uh, as it was used to promote you know, uh, a war agenda. But his use of the word propaganda meant persuasive language, using persuasive language uh, to what his view was necessary was to guide democracy by creating an ideas that the, that the mob, the masses, the unruly, irrational grew, all you guys, me, right? That we're all irrational, crazy, borderline, genocidal lunatics. And what has to happen is that an elite group of people has to guide our opinions by activating what was at that time a nascent instinct in us, which was personal desire. 
creating the image in our minds that our life is ours and our happiness can be pursued and our desires can be fulfilled, and then setting us on a path to, to uh, fulfill those, idea, uh, those, those desires in a way that's constructive and feeds back positively into the economy and doesn't result in pogroms and, and, and genocide and other things like that. Okay. Bernays, one of his, uh, he, he, he lived in America. He was, like I said, he was Freud's uncle, oh, sorry, Freud's nephew by Freud's sister. And he um, uh, went into advertising. He essentially invented Madison Avenue. He invented Mad Men, right? He invented the idea of advertising. And he saw it as a means not just of selling products, although it certainly was that, but of also instituting social control over what could be an unruly mob. And his first, uh, or not first, but one of his major, you, you might want to say, contributions <laughs> to this effort was in the 1920s, uh, selling Lucky Strike cigarettes to women. So in the 20s, uh, it was not really socially acceptable for women to smoke cigarettes. It was in fact illegal, in, it was, except for in designated areas, much like it is today for everybody. Right? You could get, women could get arrested, but not men, for, for smoking. And Eddie Bernays had an office uh, in New York that had a view of the Statue of Liberty, and he had a client, Lucky Strike, who wanted to double their, their profits. And he saw the Statue of Liberty holding up this torch. And so he created a movement called the Torches of Liberty, where women would defiantly walk down the street holding a, cigar a lit cigarette aloft. And he organized marches. He hired women. These are employees of Lucky Strike or of his ad firm or whoever to do this. And then he pretended it was a news event. He pretended it was an organic grassroots campaign of women who were not only associated themselves with the desire to smoke in public, which is a you know, you could admit it's a pretty trivial kind of freedom, but that was attached to suffragism, attached to women's right to vote, attached to the idea, the new idea, that women should be equal to men in our society, right? And that was uh, what was at that time a sublimated desire on the part of both men and women, right? But especially of women. It's like an obvious, let me create within you, or attach to within you, the desire for social equality and associate that desire with my product, and then have you demonstrate using my product in a, in, a, in a way that defies social inequality, and thereby feel better about yourself for having picked up what turned out to be a deadly habit. Right? And he used this technique again and again and again, you know, until we got into the 50s and 60s, where advertising became a, uh, a highly evolved science, based largely on Freud's ideas, of taming the unruly mob. So his uh, notion, Bernays' notion of taming the unruly mob came from give the unruly mob something relatively harmless that they want, you know, and that'll satisfy them. Create desire in them for something besides revolution or destruction. The other one of Freud's famous relatives is his daughter, Anna Freud, um, his, his final child with um, Bernays' uh, aunt. Um, and she stayed by her father for pretty much the totality of his life. He died in 1939, um, um, sort of backing up his work and, and that kind of thing. And after her, her father passed, he, he, was, uh, he died in 39 in the midst of World War II, uh, having fled Germany. Um, it, she carried on his work in America, and her orientation was around childhood development. And she had this fundamental, if you can think of Bernays as kind of like the carrot, he's offering this reward, you know. Um, uh, Anna Freud offered the stick, right? She said, you know, children need to be socialized from a very young age toward pro-social and harmless things. And this is somebody who like saw the Holocaust occur and said, what happens here is you have a whole generation of underparented people who'd been abused throughout the early part of the century who reacted highly negatively. So if we can just create a nurturing environment for children where they are only allowed to fly within a fairly narrow band, we can keep them from rising up and validating dictators and, and taking over the world. And so this is why, if you've ever seen, you can see them on YouTube and the, things like that, you see these old movies uh, about how to go on a date, how to comb your hair, how to brush your teeth, how to go to bed, how to tie your shoes, <laughs> you know, basic, basic social interaction that you would think you could just teach kids directly. It's like, why do you need a movie for this? 
that was motivated in a large part by, by Anna Freud and, and her theory, essentially, or her adaptation of her father's theories, uh, which said that the way you prevent the next Holocaust is that you socialize an entire generation of children towards civility and decency and dignity. And you essentially cram it down their throats from the beginning that they will never go off of this track. Now this documentary, Century of the Self, is in four parts. It's on YouTube. I highly recommend it if you're interested in the psychological history of how we got here because it will reveal a lot about why you guys and me and everybody else don't all think like a 19th century American. Okay, so what does this have to do with the augmented world? Right. So in following up Bernays and Anna Freud and Sigmund Freud um, and also Carl Jung, um, we developed throughout the 20th century a series of psychometric tools for measuring personality <laughs> traits and uh, orientations and desires and, and things you might want. Now, I want to preface what I'm about to go into here by saying that there is very little scientific validity to anything that I'm about to present. There has not been a great deal of clinical validation of any of the personality models that are currently being widely used. There's some. It doesn't appear to be invalid or arbitrary, but it's largely self-validated stuff made up by people who just thought, hey, here's an idea, why don't I just say this? Okay. So why do I bring it in? Well, for two reasons. One, that doesn't mean it's not being used. So, you know, it's just like if you take something like astrology, it's worth knowing about astrology because so many people believe in it, and you might end up in a place where someone's applying, you know, astrological theory, and you might think it's complete hogwash, and it probably is, but not having the vocabulary of it would leave you in the dark in terms of how other people are thinking about the world. And the psychological tools I'm about to show you are being used widely in industry and other places to orient career development and things like this. And so this is a system to learn how to hack like anything else, is learn how to position yourself in a personality matrix to where an employer is going to want to hire you. Secondly, for what I do, I'm working in an entertainment field where we are looking at ways of uh, providing more narrative to you and your social interactions and that kind of thing. That's a completely self-validating system. We're not offering you any clinical analysis or anything else. This is for entertainment purposes. So if we use a schema and that schema connects with you and you like what we did and you hit plus one on our app, that's all we really care about. So I'm not making any clinical claims on any of these tools. I'm saying this is where we are. And also, um, you know, ultimately, the, the, just like the, the example of Aristotle and Freud, we're at the beginning of a science in terms of this. Thing. We've been doing this for a century, but we've only been able to start to collect data from wide groups of people since these things came along. So just like geocentrism and, you know, uh, uh, negative inertia and all these ideas that came out of Aristotle ultimately get disproven by the scientific method, we're at a point here where we are interestingly wrong and we're going to see the development of tools that become less and less wrong as we go forward. And so you'll want a little bit of background in that. So the first tool is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Um, this is a system that we use in game development and in social uh, network app development where we are essentially uh, putting you at different levels of payoff for things throughout your life. We have, we have these, this, this, this analogy. It was developed by Abraham Maslow and it essentially creates a a hierarchy that he posited um, uh, adds up to happiness as you clear each level of the hierarchy. Further down the hierarchy is more basic, higher up in the hierarchy is more refined, and if you don't have the more basic elements satisfied, you won't be able to engage much with the more refined elements. So essentially you have your basic physiological needs, food, water, air, you know, uh, essential, essential comfort. Um, then you have safety, security, you know, that kind of thing. Then you have a connection to other people, uh, uh, sexual relationships and friendship. Then you have your own self-esteem and, and your notion of, of uh, uh, being a good member of the community and that kind of thing. And then you have your higher self-actualization, your philosophy and your moral. And again, there's a lot of criticism of this uh, that suggests that, you know, actually self-esteem is important all the way down and that you, you're not going to meet your physical needs if you don't have enough self-esteem to get up and, and take care of them. And that, that really this is probably much more of a spectrum than a hierarchy where there's biases toward one part or another depending on your, on your situation and, and certain needs are more urgent than others. But just because something's more urgent doesn't mean the other things aren't present. You know? So always grain of salt with this stuff. But whenever we're developing things, we always think about what Maslow level we're working at with you on. OK? 
okay? I want to, you know, essentially with a social app, I want to start you off somewhere in here, right? Get you moving between validating your self-esteem and hooking you up with your friends and your family in ways that, you know, are hap make you happy while getting you up into the, and using that energy to get you up into the self-actualization stage. It's like, how can I get you to cohesively state your philosophy or, or you really commit to your faith or really get into science and, and understanding the world, you know, by getting you rewards at the lower levels. All right. So navigating Maslow's hierarchy is one of the ways that we think of developing what we call the user experience for a game or for a the social app or for anything else. Once I've started up, what Maslow level am I at? What Maslow level do I end up at? I better be going up. And what levels are, are the app addressing? No? Okay. Okay. A second big tool that we use uh, in, in figuring out how to manipulate you into buying our product is uh, personality tests. And again, these personality tests were developed starting with Carl Jung uh, back in Freud's time. Um, not a whole lot, again, of clinical data to back it up. Largely, it's based upon uh, um, uh, anecdote and upon uh, uh, the clinical experience of Carl Jung. He, he analyzes patients and say, I've noticed this, I've noticed that. So that's a self-selected group and you know those kinds of things. So grain of salt. But Carl Jung identified four major modes in which people interact into two, in two groups. Uh, first is the, um, the, the perceiving group, which is intuition and sensation. And the second is the judging group, which is thinking and feeling. Okay. And what he's basically said is that everybody has all four of these aspects. Everybody has all four of these functions. One of them is dominant in your particular personality. Okay. One of them is highly submissive. And the other two are auxiliary, you know, that they are sort of available to you, but not, not, not highly urgent. And what you did was um, you used intuition, sensation, and or sensation <laughs> to figure out how you receive information about the world. So a sensor is somebody who is dealing with the immediate concrete reality. It's warm. It's cold. This thing is moving. This car is moving too fast. I don't know what's going on. Let's fix this. Immediate sensation. An intuitive person is dealing with their comprehension, their understanding of how things ought to work, right? It's like, okay, we're in England, so you have to be on the other side of the road, and the rule is here, and it's you know, and, and the situation is this, so let's figure it out, without necessarily saying you know, um, dealing with the with the immediate concrete reality, okay? And neither one is right or wrong, and we both do both of these things. We both have big picture conceptualizations of how things ought to be going and some idea of whether they're conforming to those expectations. And we also have immediate sensations that we're reacting to that, that set off alarm bells or give us comfort. The other axis in here, the thinking versus feeling axis, is how you make decisions on the basis of the information that you've integrated. So what's your outward reaction to decisions that you've made? A thinker is somebody who relies more on their thoughts, on logic, you know, and on, on conclusions. So I might say something like, you know, my aunt is, uh, it's not true, but my aunt is recently widowed and my uncle died, you know, fairly young, so she must be, as a thinker, I would be saying, and, you know, she's going to be uh, uh, in an up and down emotional state. I better make plans to be able to either be by her side or leave her alone, depending on what she wants, because that's reasonable. A feeler uses their emotions and their sense of, of how things feel to them to make equally rational decisions, right? So, uh, potentially equally rational. So I might, if I was a feeler, say, gee, I feel really sorry for my aunt, you know, she's young and, and her husband died unexpectedly, and if that happened to me, you know, I, I would be, I don't know how I would feel. I'd want to feel the comfort of my family, but I'd also want time to myself. I wouldn't want to feel any duty to them. So uh, I'm going to try and interact with her on that level, you know, uh, uh, empathizing with how she feels and, and, and t play it by ear and make sure that I'm available to, to provide whatever comfort she wants or, or lack thereof. Right? And so both of those, you know, coming to the same conclusion based on the, uh, an equally rational process, but in one case, I modeled the way I think people generally behave, and in the other case, I modeled how I felt, or would feel under those circumstances. Okay. Jung added one more factor to this, which is introversion versus extroversion, which is probably one of the 
the most critical factors, actually, in, in personality, and probably one of the less controversial ones, is that we each have an introverted and an extroverted mode, and some of us are introverts or extroverts. And what, if you're an extrovert, it does not mean that you're more social than anybody else. And if you're an introvert, it doesn't mean you're shy. What it means if, to be an extrovert is that you gain energy from the company and the presence of other people and from interactions with other people. And you expend your energy when you're alone and working out what to do next. Okay, so it, it costs you energy to be by yourself and it gives you energy to be surrounded by, by you know, especially supportive people. An introvert has the opposite reaction. An introvert, I'm an introvert, I gain a lot of energy from being alone and from working out my ideas and thinking things through. And I expend energy in a situation like this. Well, it doesn't mean that I don't enjoy this. I clearly do. I've been here for 17 years. But it means that this costs me energy and preparing for this talk revitalizes me. Right? Where an extrovert would be loving this part and gaining energy here and have thought of it to be tedious homework to, to prepare. Right? And we might both give an equally good talk. So he had these three factors, introversion, extroversion, sensing uh, versus intuition, and thinking versus feeling. And he created personality types based on this. Now, along comes mother and daughter pair, uh, Isabel uh, Briggs Myers and Catherine Briggs. I'm saying. I forget which one is the Myers or Briggs, the mother and daughter, who became fascinated with Carl Jung. And they created what is now the most popular uh, uh, personality type test uh, that you'll find on the internet, the Myers-Briggs personality indicator. How many people have seen the MBTI? Okay, so, so I, I'm going to tell you. It gives you a four-letter code for your personality type. I have to stress that the way it's currently being used on the internet is not the way that Myers and Briggs intended. Um, we can take a little bit of comfort in the fact that they didn't have an incredibly scientific process, so kind of who cares what they intended. But you're not really supposed to be pigeonholing people on the basis of MBTI. It is not an aptitude test. It's not a test of what you're good at. It's a test of how you are oriented, of how you feel oriented to the world. And with only 10 minutes left, I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but basically they took Jung's three categories, introversion, extroversion, sensing and intuition, thinking and feeling, okay, and they added a fourth, which is judging versus perceiving. And fundamentally, it's a little complicated, but basically judging versus perceiving determines which of the two middle categories you use dominantly in your dominant mode or extroversion. So an extrovert who's a judge uses their judging instinct when they are uh, dealing outwardly with people and uses their perceiving instinct internally. But an introvert who is judging uses their thinking um, category externally with other people and their judging category internally. It's on Wikipedia. <laughs> but basically what it does is it boils you down to 16 different types. Okay, and these 16 different types are archetypal and they map to the types in other kinds of tests like the Enneagram and the Big Five uh, to give you a basic personality type that you are that you can identify with. Okay, uh, I will say before I move on to the next slide, there is uh, there are two major criticisms of this model that, uh, that the clinical world has taken on. One is that it's dichotomous, right? You're an introvert or an extrovert, you're a sensor or a feeler, right? Where we're thinking now that probably personality is a vector of independent variables where you, know, you just have a rating on, on a bunch of things that doesn't subtract from something else. Secondly, it does not confront abnormal psychology. And most of us are our major Fun dysfunctions in this life come from some element of abnormal psychology, neurosis or, thing, or anxiety or things like that. The big five personality test corrects for that. It is five factors, um, close, uh, um, openness and conscientiousness and introversion, extroversion, agreeableness and neurosis that are independent, right? You're, you're, you can be all of one and it doesn't take away from the other. And it includes neurosis. It includes your emotional stability, uh, which, is, which is a major personality factor. So anyway, but Myers-Briggs, even though it's, it's kind of fallen out of clinical favor, is, is very big in entertainment and in the corporate world and things like that because of these archetypes, right? That each of the 16 types has a different archetype associated with it of the kind of person, not that you are, not that you're good at being, but that you're oriented to be, that you have a mindset toward. You might have no talent for it, but you have a mindset for it. Okay, and then there were these these sort of archetypal things like, you know, what was I'm an INTP, so where is that? 
by them are the architect. Sometimes I'm INTJ, it's a mastermind, right? Other people are the counselors, the teachers, you know, those kinds of things. These are, uh, the value of this stuff is not so much for clinical analysis, it's, it's for self-identification. If you get onto Facebook and you go into the Myers-Briggs groups, you'll find all kinds of people relating to each other on the basis of we're all NTs here and all that kind of stuff, and I can't stand those S and Fs and what are they doing, you know, messing up my world. And, you know, it might, might be a little bit, you know, crazed. But what it allows us to do is to associate ourselves with archetypal characters in literature and in film. So here's an example of a kind of chart that you'll see online of like a bunch of different characters and historical figures and actors and people like that from, from you know, and their personality types. And you can begin to relate to them. You can say, oh yeah, you know, Darth Vader did do that or House does do that or, you know, I'm kind of like, uh, you, you know, Stephen Colbert. That, yeah, that's right, you know. And you can break it down, you know, by specific thing if you're uh, Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, you got Harry <laughs> Potter, right? All the characters fall into these categories. And what this does for us, for me, for somebody who's looking at this as an entertainment thing, I'm not here to cure your neurosis, it creates self identified groups. It's like being a sports fan or into, you know, truck pools or something, you're, there's, you're wrestling, right? There are these figures that you can identify with, right? So I'm going to look at this and I'm going to say, oh, you know, where is it? Uh, yeah, do I do I associate myself with Meister Eamon? I'm not sure that I do, you know, but I certainly don't associate myself with that guy. I mean, he's massacring people and he's a white supremacist. But um, I can I can engage with that idea. It's like, well, I'm, you know, uh, I don't like what he did, and, and 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 I can, or I do like what he did, um, and I can enjoy understanding the characters in this a little bit better. And that's where we kind of close the loop on what I see us doing going forward with this quantified self and augmented reality and the image of the self and everything that came down to us through advertising and through television, radio, internet, and now phones that has created these little engines that we are of desire and self-reflection and self-definition. We're all little Madonnas in our heads now. We all reinvent ourselves constantly. We, we, we associate ourselves with different kinds of personalities and different kinds of ideas like we are in one big theater group in the world, right? Uh, how many of you have the experience of kind of having an online persona that's not entirely the way you are with your friends in the real world or with your family, right? So we, we all have these different personae that we put on and we're kind of aware of it now. It's not, it's always been true, but now we're aware of it. The adoption of personae and moving those personae into stories and deriving those stories from your real life, which is what my company is working on, requires us to look a little bit into literature. And so the next little bit of homework to look at is Joseph Campbell's monomyth. And I'm going to take about, I'm going to take 90 seconds to rant on this. Talk about lack of scientific basis for anything. Joseph Campbell's monomyth, if anybody here is a writer, looking to be a writer, what you need to do is learn the monomyth and then completely forget about it. <laughs> because the Campbellian monomyth has been misunderstood and misapplied uh, for generations now at this point, for like 50 years certainly since Star Wars, uh, it is not a story generation machine. How many people are familiar with the basic idea of the monomyth? Okay, not too many. So Joseph Campbell uh, uh, created this, this thing, uh, um, this idea, this model of uh, human storytelling in his book, uh, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And basically what he did is he analyzed a lot of cultures, mostly Western cultures, but some Eastern cultures as well, and found common threads in all of the stories that we have had from our tribal past um, that appear in every culture and that every culture seems to understand. And he assembled them into a story, a singular story that's called the hero's journey. Anyone heard of the hero's journey? Okay. So the hero's journey has a bunch of steps. I'm not going to go all through it, but these are all elements that you'll see. Certainly if you watch Star Wars, Star Wars was very explicitly just a construction of the hero's myth, right? So, so it's a very good way to just get the idea out. That you, you know, you, you meet the wizard, you go to the underworld, you confront the father, you redeem to the mother, you do all this, all this stuff. The reason it's been misunderstood is because people think that every story boils down to the, to, the, to the hero's journey, you know? So Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, yeah, sure, okay, maybe, but how about, you know, uh, uh, j just anything, you know, from, from like an Eastern Kung Fu movie, it's all here. <laughs> Not really. Not every story does. There are plenty of human stories that don't boil down to a hero's journey. You can try and shoehorn everything in and try and look for elements of the hero's journey and everything, but it's not always the most precise thing. What the monomyth means, it doesn't mean that every story boils down to the monomyth. It means that every culture comprehends the monomyth. 
There are other monuments. There are other universal constructions um, of, of, of our human stories. But this one's particularly useful because it's so ingrained in our culture, especially for entertainment purposes, for, for, for lighter entertainment, that studying the monomyth will help you to learn why Luke goes into the tree the same way that Harry goes down to this dungeon, the same way that you know, some character in a Greek myth you know, goes into Hades, why, where all these things are coming from. And so as we are looking at sort of that more classical mythology and dealing with quantified self data, Facebook posts, selfies, my latest hairstyle, what my caddy for breakfast, you know, and looking to tie this together into kind of one thing. It's like, how do I make Luke Skywalker out of uh, you know, my caddy and breakfast? The literary tradition that we want to look into for this is stream of consciousness. And my favorite Super Conscious book is, uh, well, my favorite is Finnegan's Wake, but I would not recommend reading that. I'm going to go with Ulysses by James Joyce. It's a, it's a um, story about, uh, it's, it's very modern, actually, uh, for a postmodern piece. It's a story about two men walking through Dublin on a particular day. Um, and each of the scenes is kind of constructed around uh, uh, Homer's Odyssey. You have you have uh, Circe and the pigs. You have a uh, Cyclops. You have all these these moments that come out of the Odyssey that are really just people in Dublin who are behaving in some way that's that's analogous. Okay, and uh, what it has to speak to us in our generation, a you know, hundred years later, is the, the 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 point of view in the novels is, is from these two two men essentially, and then late at, in the final chapter from the wife of one of the men who she represents, Penelope who she's absent through much of the book, and then she has a huge chapter at the end, uh, is that it's, it's, it's their thoughts flowing out over their knowledge of literature and theater and music and life in Dublin and all this kind of stuff, kind of the way that we post to Facebook today. Like, you might go and find a little story and uh, something somebody posts on Twitter, and you might relate it to some movie you saw, and you might say that I felt just like that. And that's the way that Leopold Bloom and Stephen Daedalus relate to themselves in this book. There are plenty of other examples of what is called the stream of consciousness style, which is what we are attempting to capture in the quantified self. Uh, so here I just have a little bit of a list. Mrs. Dalloway, uh, Sound of the Fury, it's, very, it's about the collapse of a southern family. Gravity's Rainbow is one of my favorite novels. It's about a, uh, an American who travels through Europe in the, at the, in the end of World War II, and he encounters a lot of mythological, weird, hallucinatory reality that really reflects the politics of the 70s. Uh, in Search of Lost Time, also called uh, 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 Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust, how he, he's about a guy who eats, eats a sugar cookie and he, his whole childhood wakes up in his life and it's a very kind of Freudian thing. Fight Club, a little more modern version of this. It's a very, Fight Club's a very sensory book. If you've been on the, on the, you know, it's like everything, it's, it's about my lungs felt like acid and my brain was burning like a monkey was on fire or whatever. Uh, Bell Jar, Sylvia Plath, you know, uh, uh, another great one. And so all this kind of stream of consciousness, this is the way that we, it used to be a very advanced form of literature. It's now the way that we relate to each other every day. If you hang out on Facebook, if you look at Twitter, that's all stream of consciousness, right? And there are ways, it's unstructured, open-ended poetry form. And we have a literary tradition for how to put it into a more pleasing narrative form that can feed back to the people who want to be looking at orcs and knowing what time it is. So that's it for me. Uh, I'm reachable here. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. In game development, how do you go all the way to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy? Like um, we, uh, we can if we have a, a physiological feedback system. Right, so, uh, and, and, and uh, we have, um, not like satisfying your food and your shelter needs, but more like, I have the sense in this timing that I've been revving you up for 15 minutes, I need to cool you down. Or I've been putting you through a logical puzzle for some time, so I, I gotta give you an action scene. So we have the sense of, of, 
of pleasing physiological feedback. But by and large, in game development, what we're looking for uh, is something in the, at the higher level because it's a trivial behavior. It's not. It's not serving a basic physiological need. What about, like the need for shelter in something like Minecraft? Where that kind of goes? Well, in the, the in the Maslow hierarchy, we're talking about literal shelter. We're talking about getting a roof over your head. So Minecraft is feeding on that psychology. It's a model that you're creating in your head of like my I need shelter because the storm is coming. I'm, I'm tweaking that that instinct. But the actual level that I'm appealing to you at is at a more conceptual one, because if your characters die in Minecraft, you're, you're not literally you know, in, in this kind of shape. But the, the, but the short answer is, yeah, we, we create a model, uh, uh, like in The Sims. The Sims is all based on Maslow. So you are guiding your Sims around. They have to eat and go to the bathroom and sleep and go to work and all this kind of stuff. And, and you may have noticed if you've ever played that game that your basic physiological needs are the first thing that you have to satisfy. And then you go up and up and up and up and up to your aspirations. And if you fail at them, you start to fall back down. Your house gets messy and all that kind of stuff. That's a complete modeling of Maslow. But you, the player, aren't going through that. Your character is. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you.